Welcome to the Kotki Ride Home for Wednesday, January 26th, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, is there liquid water under Mars's ice cap or isn't there? Recent studies have claimed both. And what about an underground ocean on Saturn's Death Star moon? Here are all of your space water updates. Plus, the origins of the melodramatic dun-dun-dun sound. And an old SpaceX rocket stage is on track to slam into the moon this March. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. Maybe you've seen some headlines this past week about liquid water being discovered under the south polar cap of Mars. Or maybe you've seen headlines saying that there is not water there. Or maybe even what some researchers thought was water but was actually volcanic rock. What is going on? Is there liquid water under the Martian ice cap or not? Luckily, Phil Plate over at Bad Astronomy is here to clear things up. So basically the is there, isn't there about liquid water in this particular location on Mars has been going back and forth since at least 2018. That's when a team of planetary scientists using ground penetrating radar on the European Space Agency's Mars Express spacecraft found evidence for what they called a whole lake of liquid water beneath the South Pole ice cap on Mars. And earlier this week, some folks from that same team reaffirmed their findings, adding that briny water could explain some of the doubts posed by others over the years. And by doubts, I mean that last year, a different team of scientists published findings proposing that a number of other materials could have caused the radar signals that the first team was interpreting as water. And then yet another team of scientists on Monday came to a similar conclusion, this time showing that volcanic rock under ice could be giving off the signal interpreted as water. Now, all of these studies and explanations are based on that original data from the ESA's Mars Express and its MARSIS tool, which stands for Mars Advanced Radar for Subsurface and Ionosphere Sounding. Quoting Bad Astronomy, Marsis bounces signals off the surface of the red planet to map the topography, but some of the radar can penetrate ice. The south pole of Mars has an extensive cap of water ice on it, more than three kilometers deep in some places. In one spot, though, and later more places, the radar return from Marsis was brighter than expected from just ice. This bright layer was consistent with it being a lake of briny water, though a very shallow one less than a meter thick and 20 kilometers across. But then the second team looked at other materials that could reflect radar in the same way, including clays, metal-bearing minerals, and very salty ice. All of these are common on Mars, while you need special conditions to keep water liquid that close to the surface. Very high salinity, a subsurface heat source like magma, and so on. So the original claim got weaker. The third team that published Monday did something clever. They looked at pre-existing Mars' radar reflection maps of other regions of Mars, which can be mapped to known terrains like volcanic regions, plains, and so on. They then created models of what those terrains would look like to Mars' if they were covered in ice like that at the Martian South Pole. While the exact mineral compositions of those areas may not be known, their reflectivities are, so they can still be used to see what the instrument would see if they were buried under ice, end quote. And that is how they came to the conclusion that volcanic rock would give off similar signals to liquid water. And since volcanoes are common on Mars, it's not too far of a stretch. But then we come to the most recent paper from Tuesday, which conducted a lab experiment showing water can still be a liquid at that super cold base of the ice temperature. We're talking negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 75 degrees Celsius if it's a briny solution of perchlorates. Like volcanoes, perchlorate is also common on Mars. So which team is right here? 
Well, we can't really know. And that's ultimately where Plate lands too. Any team claiming complete certainty about liquid water existing beneath the Martian South Polar surface or not, based on all available data right now, is extrapolating too much with too little evidence. As Plate puts it, quote, What can be said is that under some conditions, liquid water can exist in these places. But the observations are also consistent with a layer of various minerals and rocks rocks, so there's not enough to make a firm claim either way. Arguments can be made for and against both ways. Yes, volcanic rock works, but the kind they found is relatively rare on Mars, only on about 2% of the surface. That makes it seem unlikely that this is the cause. Yes, perchlorate brines can keep water liquid at very low temperatures, but then you need something deeper under the surface, possibly a pool of magma, to keep the temperature even that high. And you have to be careful when using special circumstances to explain an observation. End quote. He also notes that if liquid water is there, it would be so briny that it probably wouldn't support organic molecules, so it would kind of negate the whole reason that liquid water on Mars would be exciting to begin with. But hey, there's somewhere else that might have liquid water, Saturn's moon Mimas, aka the Death Star Moon, so named because of a prominent crater on its gray surface giving it an uncanny likeness to the Empire's secret weapon, Mimas made headlines earlier this month for the possibility that it's housing an entire underground ocean. Here's The Verge, quote, while the surfaces of both Jupiter's Europa and Saturn's Enceladus show signs of geologic activity suggesting an internal heat source that allows liquid water to exist, the surface of Mimas is heavily cratered, leading Southwest Research Institute scientist Alyssa Rodin to suspect it was just a frozen block of ice, according to a press release. However, Rodin now thinks Mimas' cratered-like appearance kept an ocean hidden. In research published earlier this month in the journal Icarus, Rodin and her colleague Matthew Wall Walker of the Planetary Science Institute in Tucson, Arizona, show that tiny wobbles or librations in the moon's orbit detected by NASA's Cassini spacecraft can be explained by gravitational interactions with Saturn that produce enough heat to maintain a liquid ocean beneath a thick icy shell. A model developed by the team suggests that icy shell is 14 to 20 miles thick. The findings suggest Mimas is a compelling target for further investigation, wrote and said in a release, end quote. So we're talking about a possible ocean about 10 million cubic kilometers or more, a thousand times the amount of water in Lake Superior, says Plate. But just like the liquid water on Mars, Plate emphasizes that this new paper does not prove the underground ocean on Mimas actually exists, just that, quote, the physics allows it, and it would explain the odd orbit of the moon and some of its behavior as it orbits Saturn, end quote. While it would open up a lot more questions about Mimas' formation, the possibility of this underground ocean is pretty exciting, because even if Mimas doesn't have liquid water, even if Mars doesn't have liquid water, the idea that a tiny moon could just reinforces how much potential for life there is out there, even just within our own solar system. In many ways, we have only just begun to scratch the surface. We're all familiar with this sound. But where did it come from? How did it become lodged in our public consciousness as an auditory indication that something villainous has just occurred? Amelia Tate over at The Guardian recently dove into the sound's origins and how it evolved over time from a serious reveal of nefarious activity to a corny joke. So the sound, more specifically referred to as a sting, a quick surge of music used almost like a sound effect, think of a sound logo, this sting has its origins in radio dramas in the mid-20th century. Richard Hand, a media professor at the University of East Anglia, explained to Tate, quote, One of the challenges of radio, and it's the same now as it was a hundred years ago, is how do you hook the listener? Those dramatic organ stings could have a powerful effect. They became cliched and 
and we laugh at them, but actually what soundscapes can do can be extraordinary, end quote. And Tate adds that stings and sound effects, you know, claps of thunder, whistling wind, were often performed live alongside the dialogue back in the days before sound libraries. Tate was able to dig up a few early instances of the dun-dun-dun sting in mid-century radio shows, but speculates that the sting, as audiences would recognize it, might actually predate radio. Hand backs this up by saying that radio usually adopted already popular tropes to listeners, tropes from stage performances mostly. And Patrick Feaster, co-founder of the First Sounds Initiative, agrees. Feaster says that similar stings with similar objectives appeared in a 1912 vaudeville sketch parodying melodramas. And that sketch, called Desperate Desmond, which you can listen to a recording of courtesy of the Library of Congress, link in the show notes, is filled with stings and sound effects that the narrator directs in various ways, clearly playing on how the sound effects are recognizably used already in different different ways in the melodramas that it's parodying. It doesn't use the exact dun-dun-dun one, but it's close, and the way it plays with sound cues indicates that even though some melodramas would continue using the sting seriously for decades thereafter, as early as 1912, audiences were aware enough of it to laugh at its usage. Feaster even thinks that the famous dun-dun-dun sting could have ended up with three notes instead of one because it exaggerated the silliness of the sting, and so it was the preferred version for parody. And parodied it certainly has been. Countless movies, cartoons, and now YouTube videos and TikToks have used the sting over the last century. And for any that have incorporated it into their creation over the last 38 years, they were probably pulling from one particular source. Shock Horror Parentheses A by composer Dick Walter. Walter was hired by KPM Music in 1983 to produce four albums worth of musical phrases that would become The Editor's Companion. He used a full orchestral lineup to make many of the stings that we still use and hear today. Here's a few more that you might recognize. Now, he didn't come up with all of those, but the arrangements and recordings that he did became the gold standard, and his version of the dun-dun-dun shock horror, as he titled it, most of all. Walter told Tate that the sting is effective because it makes use of something called Diabolus in Musica, or the Devil's Interval, but it never resolves it. As an article from Fender explains, quote, As its Latin moniker suggests, it's an evil-sounding combination of notes that's designed to create a chilling or foreboding atmosphere. The interval was given a sinister name since listeners originally found it unpleasant and surprising. Before the tritone became a common tool in rock, listeners expected artists to play chords and patterns that were pleasing to the ear. When a tone that wasn't mellifluous, such as the triad, was inserted into a musical passage, it was unsettling since it didn't conform to the listeners' expectations. There have been rumors that in the Middle Ages, composers and singers were forbidden from using flatted fifths because of the dissonant, demonic tone it creates. And although the term Diabolus in Musica was indeed born in that era, since high clergymen found the tone to be the antithesis of godliness, there's no evidence that the technique was ever officially banned. Still, it was so distasteful to the church that no one dared to integrate it into their music. End quote. Shock horror indeed. So this dun-dun-dun stinger taps into some really primal part of our consciousness, makes us feel a little uncomfortable, and that's part of what's made it last for so long, even if we recognize it more as a sound parodying shock and horror than actually conveying it these days. Well, it looks like we're going to the moon a little bit sooner than anticipated. 
While NASA's Artemis 1 uncrewed flight test of the Orion spacecraft is set to launch on March 12th and will fly around and quite close to the moon, about a week before that, part of a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket is projected to slam into the side of the moon. This is not an intentional move. Quoting Ars Technica, Back in 2015, after the Falcon 9 rocket's second stage completed a long burn to reach a transfer orbit, NOAA's Deep Space Climate Observatory began its journey to a Sun-Earth Lagrange point more than 1 million kilometers from the Earth. By that point, the Falcon 9 rocket's second stage was high enough that it did not have enough fuel to return to Earth's atmosphere. It also lacked the energy to escape the gravity of the Earth-Moon system, so it's been following a somewhat chaotic orbit since February 2015, end quote. And now, it's on course to hit the moon right around its equator, on the far side. This is according to Bill Gray, the creator of Project Pluto, which tracks near-Earth objects. He also reached out to professional and amateur astronomers alike to add to his observational data and determine a more accurate impact timing. Now, an important note here, this is not dangerous. No life, nor any equipment is in danger of harm or interference. Gizmodo notes that the most that might happen is a a new lunar impact crater will be created, but not even one big enough to be visible from Earth. As Harvard-Smithsonian astrophysicist Jonathan McDowell put it on Twitter, quote, it's interesting, but not a big deal, end quote. That said, the better we can predict the exact timing and location, the better we can take advantage of this by using present lunar satellites to observe the impact. Ars Technica points out that NASA actually sent a spent rocket upper stage into the moon on purpose back in 2009 to study subsurface material, but this is the first time something created on Earth will be hitting the moon unintentionally. All right, well, that is it from me for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.